Hello and welcome. You're watching our special show, Coronavirus Facts vs. Myths. I'm Gargi Rawat. Stay with us for all the latest you need to know regarding the pandemic. Our top story now concerns are growing over the new strain of coronavirus identified in the United Kingdom. While efforts are on to trace passengers who arrived in India from the United Kingdom over the last couple of weeks, let's take a look at what is different with this particular strain. Now, the broad symptoms of the new strain are the same high temperature, persistent dry cough and a loss of change in taste and smell. Vaccines, uh, most experts say, should still be effective against this new strain. It's not believed to be any more deadly, but people are increasingly worried because this mutation appears to be 70% more infectious. And how do we detect this strain? Now, passengers, as we said, who came in from the UK will all be tested. And if they test positive for coronavirus, they will be isolated. Their samples will then be sent to the National Institute of Virology in Pune or any other appropriate lab for genomic sequencing to uh, detect if it is the same strain strain found in the UK. That particular strain has 23 mutations in its genetic core. Does the RT-PCR test work against the new variant and uh, can it detect the new variant? Well, so far what we do know is PCR tests detect parts of the virus's spike protein, specifically three proteins in the original coronavirus. However, it will only test positive for two of the proteins in the new variant and the genetic sequencing is the better way to detect uh, this new variant that has emerged in the United Kingdom. Here are some concerns uh, raised by experts uh, in, uh, in Mumbai also. Let's take a look at what the ICMR has to say. They say that RT-PCR which is trying to the virus is the RNA of the virus. We have to take the RT-PCR from small pieces. अगर वो छोटे पीस में अगर म्यूटेशन आ जाए तो आरटीपीसीआर टेस्ट हो सकता है कि नेगेटिव आ सकती है इस म्यूटेशन की वजह से स्ट्रेन स्पेसिफिक एसेज की जरूरत पड़ेगी जो यहां पे मोस्टली एनआईवी पुणे में होता है और बहुत कम जगह पे इंडिया में ये हो पाता है तो मेरे हिसाब से अभी जबकि ब्रिटेन से लोग आना शुरू हो रहे हैं वहां पे नया स्ट्रेन डेवलप हुआ है जो कि हो सकता है कि ज्यादा मोर्टेलिटी करने वाला या फिर ज्यादा ट्रांसमिशन करने वाला हो सकता है अभी प्रूवन नहीं है लेकिन इसको स्प्रेड रोकने के लिए हमें जो भी लोग बाहर से आ रहे हैं उनका स्ट्रेन स्पेसिफिक ऐसे करवाना बहुत जरूरी है ना कि हम रेगुलर आरटीपीसीआर करें वेदर इट वुड रियली कॉज अ सीरियस पब्लिक हेल्थ थ्रेट वी डोंट नो बट वी नीड टू रिमेन watchful and different countries are uh, taking including india um, uh, countries are taking protective measures so the travel restriction and things like that are happening but at the same time uh, we are keeping track of the viral genome that is circulating uh, within the country i'm talking about india and uh, over the last six to seven months, the viral genome studies that have taken place uh, involving more than 2,000 uh, samples that has not identified this um, mutation. Well, to talk more about this, we're now joined by uh, Dr. Ram Vishwakarma, advisor, CSIR uh, Delhi, and a former director, CSR India Institute of Integrative Medicine. Thank you so much, doctor, uh, for joining us. So. Yes, at this point, there is alarm over this new strain that's been reported in the UK. We do know that passengers here in India who arrived from the UK are being uh, traced currently. Uh, sir, so tell us, uh, first and foremost, the RT-PCR test. Can that by itself detect this new strain of coronavirus? Uh, not the one that we are using right now, because what RT-PCR test that we are using, which is approved by WHO, is not looking at the using primer for the S1 protein where all these nine mutations have happened. So I think we have to go for, we have to identify such individuals and then we have to do sequencing of those and check these mutations, which is we are doing large number of sequencing in the country and that way we can identify. And also we have to identify that what kind of, if they had a previous infection, they were under some kind of treatment, for example, monoclonal antibody or convalescent plasma and they escaped that treatment and then you know this mutation has, has has appeared so i think current kits that are being used in india and world over most of the kits are actually not using spike one uh, primers uh, where these most of the mutations have occurred 
All right, sir. So the only way to know whether somebody does have this particular strain of COVID is once they test positive to send those samples uh, to uh, the uh, National Institute of Virology in Pune or other labs like that. How many labs do we have that can actually detect this? Yeah, there are close to, I think, 20, 25 labs right now. CSIR itself, there are four laboratories of CSIR. IGIB in New Delhi is doing large-scale sequencing. We, had, we have done more than maybe 3,000 sequencing of this virus, and this number is going up. So I think this can be very easily done with the current sequencing capabilities of our country. All right. And, uh, you know, uh, the ICMR has said that so far they have not detected this particular strain in any of the samples they've used, and they've said that they've, had, uh, they've tested some 2,000 samples. Uh, but till now, we haven't really been looking for this particular strain, isn't it? Yeah, so I think the, the sequencing that has been done in India like I told you the number, where these the mutations, these nine mutations straight away coming in one protein, which is the, most, the protein which most of the vaccines are targeting, most of the antibodies are being developed against them. So that is why there is a concern for this. And so far we have not detected these mutations in our, our populations. But sir, and how likely do you think it is that given that passengers have been arriving over the last couple of days, we also know that in the United Kingdom they detected this particular strain in September. And, uh, you know, it's only now th th when they on Sunday they announced that it's, it's spreading so much and they have to go into this more stringent lockdown. But it's very possible that this strain has already arrived in India? I can't speculate, but I can tell you that South Africa, this is already there, Denmark, some of the European countries. So I would not be surprised that it's strained there because we have just detected maybe last 10 days in UK because UK is doing very high level of testing per, per uh, sort of million people. So they have detected it, but I will not be surprised that, you know, so that is why it is very necessary to actually do three things that we have to all the RT-PCR labs which are doing testing, they should revisit their protocol. If any lab in India is using as gene primer, they should not use that uh, because that will miss out this sequencing. And we have to do closely close monitoring of the people who have been under conversant plasma treatment and monoclonal antibody treatment in the country. And I think that's where the I think the sequencing work should start from those individuals. Why do you say that, sir, that uh, people who've been under, uh, uh, you know, uh, serum treatment, etc., they should be t looked at more closely? Yeah, because if they have not, these treatments have not worked on, on them, they were refractive to these treatments, then this is a far greater chance that there was a mutant which was not responding to conventional plasma or the monoclonal antibodies. So the people who have these mutations, which are most of the mutation is spike protein, if they are using an antibody which is recognizing, for example, RBG domain. So there is a one mutation, which is N501Y, which is right into RBG domain of this particular genome of the virus. So I think that is where there may be low affinity or low reactivity or low potency of those therapeutics. So there is a need to closely look at and exclude that these patients did not have these mutations. Right, sir, and the worry right now is that uh, in India currently we've seen the numbers going down. Yesterday we reported under 20,000. Today the number of cases, daily cases, has gone above 20,000. But, uh, you know, the, the cases overall in India have been coming down steadily. Yeah, so that is because of the measures which we have we are taking. I think we have to continue. We should not go into complacency that two vaccines have come. That is why we lower our guard. All these results that we see in India is because of measures that health authorities, hospitals, all of us are taking in day-to-day -day life. And that's the reason this is this is number is going coming down. So I think we have to be very, very careful at this point in time. All right, uh, Dr. Ram, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us and explaining uh, regarding uh, this new uh, uh, strain of the virus uh, in uh, the UK. Well, uh, let's now talk about Australia. And in Australia, they have detected four cases of this particular uh, strain of the virus, this variant uh, from uh, the United Kingdom, this fast-spreading uh, strain, uh, the first confirmed cases of the strain in the Asia-Pacific region. Australia's most uh, populous state, New South Wales, uh, reported six new cases of coronavirus and people returning from overseas in quarantine. And authorities said that among them, uh, two of these uh, cases of the fast-spreading new strain have been detected. Well, to talk more about uh, the situation in Australia, we're joined by Professor S.S. Vasan uh, from there, uh, the Dangerous uh, Pathogens Team Leader of CSIRO. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us. Uh, first and foremost, tell us about uh, these reports that uh, four cases of this new uh, UK strain have been traced in Australia. 
Yeah, and that's not unexpected because Australia has a very low uh, case burden at the moment. Uh, so far, we've only had about 28,000 cases. And in the last 24 hours, we've had something like 21 cases. Most of these are imported cases. So, and as you correctly mentioned, they are currently coming out of New South Wales, although Victoria had a small number. Um, and it's not unexpected that we are detecting these mutations largely from the imported cases. Uh, but I think every country does its own risk assessment. So we are uh, keeping a very close eye on the situation. And we have been tracking these mutations for a long time. So we are well prepared. Right. And, uh, and Australia hasn't stopped flights uh, from the UK. Uh, you know, a lot of countries were very alarmed with these reports and immediately uh, flight bans came into place. Uh, what is your view about this new strain? And many uh, researchers are saying uh, that what's very remarkable is the number of mutations in all 23. And apparently 17 took place altogether uh, in a very short period. And that's something that surprised researchers. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is an RNA virus which uh, will mutate and... Uh, there's nothing alarming about that. Uh, compared to the flu virus, this is not expected to mutate that fast because it has a sort of a proofreading mechanism. Nevertheless, a virus in a new host will, uh, you know, mutate. So I, I, we are not unduly alarmed by this the scientist concern. So uh, I think uh, some of the mutations which are of interest here are the H69-70 uh, uh, deletion, uh, the previous speaker mentioned the N501Y, and also uh, this is a, on top of another mutation which we have been tracking and studying, which is called the G strain or the D614G. So I think what is slightly uh, of interest to us scientists is that we are looking at accumulated mutations, uh, but the number of mutations themselves is not particularly alarming to us, uh, and this is something we have to wait and watch. Right, and uh, so far all experts are agree agreeing that, uh, you know, the, the mutations aren't expected to affect the vaccines that have been developed. Uh, what is your view on that? Uh, yeah, they are not very likely to affect the vaccines. Uh, so my lab here, we were the first in the world to show uh, through experiments backed by computer modeling that the previous mutation, which was uh, widely reported in the media, known as G-strain, uh, which is also a, 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 a a clade which will transmit more readily, but not necessarily leading to a more severe disease. So we were the first to show that uh, vaccines, including the Oxford vaccine, which is manufactured in the Serum Institute of India um, in Pune, uh, is not going to be affected by that particular mutation. Based on what we know up to this point, I think we can be reasonably confident that vaccines may not be affected. However, um, unless we confirm this experimentally, we scientists want to be cautious. Uh, we can only do that by end of January or so, because based on, I was in a WHO teleconference uh, last night, and based on the current situation, uh, right. for scientists to be able to establish that will take some time. All right, and speaking of uh, vaccines, what is the status of uh, COVID research in Australia as a science agency? Uh, so at the CSIRO, which is the National Science Agency, uh, we were the first to establish the ferret model, and we did a lot of preclinical studies for the leading vaccines, including the Oxford vaccine. Uh, we also tested the Oxford vaccine intranasally, uh, as well as giving it as an injection. So we've submitted those results to the regulatory agencies, which fed into those uh, clinical studies which subsequently happened. Uh, we are now, we have also been doing a lot of research on tracking these mutations, trying to understand the impact of these mutations on vaccines and so on. Uh, I've also been working on uh, clinical research right now, uh, working with various uh, clinical collaborations here to look at prognosis for uh, COVID-19. So, uh, so a lot of interesting research is happening. But what I would like to emphasize is we also work very closely with India, with IGIB, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, so this is a global disease and we have to be very collaborative and work with each other to combat this problem. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Vastan, for speaking to us here at NDTV. Thank you.
Now, since the start of the pandemic, companies have been developing new technologies or restyling old ones to help you sanitize your homes and offices and make your environments more safe from HEPA filters to UV technology. Today, we're going to talk about a new cleaning method, a new technology developed by Protexer for ensuring a safe work environment. It's an antimicrobial nanotechnology using something called SPAR-90, which is a water-based molecule. It's odorless and non-toxic. Well, to talk more about about this and explain it better. We're joined by Latika Khaneja, Managing Director of Protexer. Thank you so much, Latika, for being with us. Perhaps you can do a better job of explaining what is this new technology. Yeah. Hi, Garki. Um, this is something that has been in existence, I understand. Probably the Dow company invented it in the 1970s, but uh, possibly there was no uh, need for such a highly uh, you know, this it was sort of an overqualified product, but with the pandemic, there's a realization that uh, we need other sanitization methods. Chemical um, treatments are leaching, they are toxic, they can be used in moderation, but uh, they do give an instant kill. But after that, any uh, contact of infection with the surface uh, just propagates the entire thing back again. So the product that we have, it is a coating. It's like a laminate on surfaces and uh, it creates a bed of spars. And those spars, uh, when they come in contact with 99% of pathogens, they impale uh, the pathogens on the spars. So, uh, I mean, recognizing that probably it's not only COVID, it's, it's a virus of any sort that can attack us. We do anticipate it being an SOP in the future and we've been in business only since July but most of the leading companies uh, are on board with this technology and we're really waiting for more offices and all to open up for it to become a little more widespread. Uh, so the idea is that we coat the surface and we uh, let it, um, it, it, it protects from pathogens for 90 days subject to abrasion and so it becomes a much easier solution for moving into the new normal because all that chemical and disruption, people can go back to their offices, people can go to hotels, people can go to malls, recognizing the fact that the surfaces now are, um, are, are coated. And so anybody who came here last and touched the lift button or sat on a sofa or sat on a restaurant chair, the, those uh, droplets of whatever uh, body fluids will not infect them. And you're saying that this actually provides uh, protection for 90 days. Also, uh, you know, the safety, it, it's non-toxic also is something, uh, you know, that, that you're claiming. Yes, it's green. It's non-toxic and there are no fumes. So all of the, the procedure is merely it's a spray. Uh, it, we do it with electrostatic machines. It's a spray and um, it dries up and the spa, in fact, you have to let it dry because the spas are created when the drying process is happening. So everything goes back to looking exactly like it was, except that you can visualize a, a room full of little spas that are attacking all sorts of pathogens. And we are doing extensive testing, 99.9% .9 means 12 bacteria. So um, we are constantly, every batch that we get, we also test it with the uh, Bureau Veritas in accredited labs. So that, and the product seems to have, uh, we are getting our second orders and reorders after the 90 days now. And I think people are happy with the product. All right. So everybody's looking for these new ways to make, you know, working environment safe, especially the air as yeah. well and the surfaces, because that used to be the big, uh, you know, talking point initially about how surfaces need to be uh, disinfected. And, uh, and, and e e the economics of it for, you know, small shops and uh, small businesses, does that also work out? Yeah, it works out. It's not going to compare to the price of chemical disinfectant. But then if you actually add up the fact that you should be doing it four or five times a day, it should be done pretty much every day. It's very labor intensive to do that spraying. And then with all the uh, negative impact of fumes and everything, I think the prices could be said to be comparable. Also, recognizing the fact that the economy is in so much of uh, trouble at the moment, we have also been negotiating since we've been buying more and all of that. The prices, we're trying to bring it more and more in line with what companies would normally pay for disinfection. And uh, everyone will require to, themselves to move to some sort of super specialization because with so many people going back to when people go back to the offices and all of that, we all would not like to see a second and a third wave uh, every time we have unlocked there has been situations so right. obviously it's people transmitting through, it's not an airborne disease so it's people transmitting it through contact with surfaces because masks and hand washing will protect you but if somebody leaves um, uh, if pathogens are left over on the surfaces then uh, you will come you'll inhale them you'll touch them and that is how the infection has been so rampant 
All right, Latika, thank you so much uh, for speaking to us and uh, you know sharing about this uh, technology uh, that's now being used for uh, making workplaces more safe for all of us. Thanks a lot. Thank you.